There is growing concern tonight about the continuing spread of the highly contagious bird flu in the U.S. As William Brangham explains, while federal health officials say the risk to humans is low, the virus has now spread to dairy cattle and sickened one person. William? That's right, Jeff. This strain of bird flu, called H5N1, has been sickening bird flocks across America for a few years now. Millions have been killed to prevent further spread. Yesterday, the country's biggest egg producer halted productions when chickens at one of its facilities got sick. But this virus has also been infecting mammals, most recently dairy cows in five different states. This week, a person in Texas tested positive after working with cattle. He's had mild symptoms and is expected to recover. For more on this virus, we are joined again by Jennifer Nuzzo. She runs the Pandemic Center at Brown University's School of Public Health. Jennifer Nuzzo, so good to have you back on the program. Dr. Mandy Cohen, the head of the CDC, says the risk to humans from this virus is low. They're monitoring it, and there's no reason to worry at this point. Is that where you come down? So I think it's true that the risk to the general public is quite low. And I think it's also important that we continue to monitor this virus to make sure that doesn't change. The one thing I do quite worry about is the risk to farm workers, people who would be exposed to the sick animals, because we do know that exposure to sick animals can uh, result in human infection. And we've already seen that now to date. Um, and it's two cases in the United States, uh, the most recent one being in uh, a, a worker that worked with uh, sick cows. Um, so I do worry, worry about protecting farm workers, but for the general public, the risk of contracting this virus is currently low. Let's talk about that infection. So this was someone who apparently had been working with cattle, cattle that had been infected with this bird virus. How should we see that route of infection? Because this does happen every now and then, a widespread infection amongst animals, and it jumps to one human. Yeah, so we've been tracking this virus for 20 years, and in the last two years, I would say, it has become a lot more concerning in terms of the number of species that this virus um, has shown itself capable of infecting. We've, you know, historically called this a bird flu virus because it has predominantly affected wild birds and uh, domesticated birds. But over the last few years, we've really seen the species range that has been affected by this virus grow quite a bit to include mammals. So th that's quite alarming. Um, this is also the first time we've seen it in cows. Uh, cows um, haven't uh, frequently been seen to get influenza A, which is the particular type of influenza virus uh, this one is. So that is also, um, you know, somewhat uh, new and surprising. Um, but uh, we have in the past see humans that have had direct contact with sick animals uh, get sick. It doesn't happen all that frequently, but when it does happen, it's quite concerning because in many of these cases, um, that infection has been quite deadly. Fortunately, in the most recent case, the infection has been quite mild. In fact, the symptoms are a little bit different than what we have typically seen in the past. Um, the sick worker uh, had, you know, conjunctivitis and eye inflammation. And so we're, while we're glad to see a mild infection, we don't yet understand why that is. So for now, at least, the jumping from a group of animals to one human is one thing. But, but if it were to go from human to human, that's when it would be really troubling. Is that correct? The predominant reason that we're worried now is because we're worried that this virus may gain additional functionality and additional ability to infect humans so that we could see human infections occur more frequently. And the worst case scenario that we worry about is this virus gaining the ability to be transmitted easily between humans. In the past, there have been a few cases that we haven't been able to rule out limited human to human transmission, but that human transmission hasn't been sustained and it's been very rare relative to the number of, of human cases we've seen, but we're watching this virus primarily to make sure it doesn't gain the ability to infect humans more easily and worse to be spread between humans easily. And right now, there is no evidence of that happening. No, there is not. So we're not worried currently, but um, we don't often get head starts or sort of early warnings about future health threats. And so why you're hearing a lot of scientists, experts, and health officials talking quite concerned in a concerned manner about this uh, particular development is because we want to make sure we get ahead of it. We want to make sure we don't allow this virus to infect many more animals or many more humans uh, to give it any uh, ability to gain uh, the functionality to infect humans more easily.
For people who are seeing that these are cases in dairy cows and egg-laying chickens and, and might worry, do I have to worry about milk and eggs? What, what do you tell them? Well, it's long been public health advice not to eat raw eggs or raw milk, and that public health advice still applies. You know, as long as you're following that guidance, you know, all the evidence we have so far is that you should be fine. The U.S., as you well know, has been focusing on the threat of pandemic influenza for decades now. But we saw how COVID punched all these holes in what we thought was a world-class, robust set of plans and preparations. Are, are you concerned that if Again, no evidence that this is happening now, but if this were to turn into something more severe, that we could respond in a, in a smart and timely way? Well, I think that's why we're having this conversation now, is to talk about what triggers are going to make us act. I think our recent experience with COVID was quite humbling in a lot of ways. Um, we have a bit more experience dealing with influenza and in particular um, dealing with a flu pandemic. People may not remember that we actually had a flu pandemic in 2009. That was not an H5N1 virus. It was an H1N1 virus. Um, and in many ways, we do have more resources and more familiarity with flu. So in some ways, you could imagine it easier. However, you know, every type of event is going to be challenging. So I think that's why it's really urgent that we use this moment where we are getting some concerning signals um, from the animal world about um, potential future human health threats to make sure we have everything we need to be able to respond if this virus um, does take a turn for the worse. All right, Jennifer Nuzzo, Brown University School of Public Health. Always great to see you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me.